Thank you. Uh, it's terrific to be back here. Um, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is read um, something. Uh, but I write so beautifully that I, I don't. <laughs> I wouldn't want to deprive you of this of this text. Um, and I think I can stay within 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. This is good. Yeah, the economic downturn uh, has had a profound effect on design and on th uh, the design professions, especially architecture. Over the last year, architecture offices, large and small, have been forced to downsize and to rethink their business and practice models. This cute but uh, unfortunate slide, I think, illustrates that. Less fortunate offices, even those of long standing, have been forced out of business altogether. All, uh, architecture and design education has also been impacted. Public and private universities alike have faced and continue to face budget cuts, hiring freezes, and reduced funding as elected officials struggle to balance state and municipal budgets. Among the most profound effects of the downturn, however, is that debate over the value of design and architecture has begun to focus less on style and the exquisite designed object and more on the economic and societal value added by design and architecture. And that is because almost everyone, especially architects, now realize that we need new design values more than we need new designs. And we see this in a kind of a proliferation of articles um, and books um, to the extent that, uh, you know, in the last year or so, there's been a kind of a rush to a kind of a moral high ground where people argue that, in fact, uh, they, their position uh, is even more close to the real and uh, to a moral uh, fundament than, than, than the other persons. We saw this, I think, uh, this debate uh, between architecture and humanity uh, last year uh, and uh, the eminent critic of the New York Times. Uh, interesting. Um, now, perhaps the most uh, promising development in this regard, and one that affects practice as well as education, is the growing recognition that design is not only a product, a table, a building, an urban plan, or landscape, but is also a creative process and a powerful engine of innovation. This could be the proverbial uh, silver lining uh, in the cloud, a chance to turn crisis uh, into opportunity. Oddly enough, in education, my own business and practice, uh, the leaders have, uh, have not been design schools, but have rather been other schools. This is an image from a recent survey of Business Week magazine where they are detailing the top, I don't remember if it's 50 or 100 uh, design schools in the, in the country. There's even one here at Michigan, Monica, uh, but it's not yours, sadly, um, or at least according to the Business uh, Week uh, uh, survey. It's one, in, I think, in creative, uh, uh, it's an MFA in, in, in creative thinking. Um, oddly enough, um, in, in this issue uh, of, of Business Week is focusing on design thinking, uh, something that has been, you know, it's been a debate for quite a while, I think, in, uh, in curricula outside of architecture. But um, the, the odd thing is that, is that the, the real places where these new curriculum are being developed are in business schools. This is uh, Roger Martin at the, uh, the, the, the Rotman School of Management uh, in Toronto. Uh, this is the D School at Stanford, where, bus where design thinking has been incorporated uh, and is very much part of the curriculum. Um, even the U.S. military um, is, uh, is more advanced in, in terms of the way in which they develop curriculum around design thinking than, uh, than design schools. As you can see uh, at, the, um, at, the, at the advanced uh, military studies at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, they actually uh, are incorporating design thinking as part, as part of their curriculum. Um, now, this approach, uh, well, going too far. This approach uh, has become crucial to a variety of schools precisely because it offers a structured uh, way to, to, to produce innovation. And uh, I'm going to offer one little quick uh, example of, of design thinking that comes, uh, that comes not so much from architecture or from product design or from the kind of design fields we talked about, we've been talking about today, but instead from engineering. And it's, a, it's an example from uh, the famous uh, engineer uh, from Uwe Arup, uh, sadly, who's passed uh, some years ago, Peter Rice. I'm going to read a little piece that I've written about, about Rice. Now, perhaps the best uh, illustration of design thinking uh, can be found in Peter Rice's wonderful posthumously, uh, posthumously published book, An Engineer Imagines, where he writes the following about engineering innovation. He says, 
probably every solution put forward by an engineer, I'm getting a phone call here, sorry, uh, has been uh, some unusual element, some feature that could be called innovative, but is not recognized because it is buried in an otherwise conventional solution. And if we examine the nature of these otherwise innovative or inventive elements, we find that it is just the result of the engineer being intelligent or sensible about the way some detail has always been, and in so reassessing the problem from another point of view. Now, Rice here reveals in this short passage the key to understanding the engineer's design process. Rather than design alternative solutions to the problem at hand, the engineer instead reassesses and reposes the problem, quote, from another point of view. Engineering, um, engineering problems, he says, are shaped by objective parameters, and so each problem has only one solution. That is why the problem must be approached with an intelligence that comes from knowing about the problem and the way it has always been, as well as knowing and understanding various solutions to an array of similar problems and objective parameters that shape them. Engineering innovations come, as Rice says, not because engineers go looking for innovative solutions. Rather, they result from the engineer shaping and reshaping the problem. Solutions are not always uh, final solutions and are more often important in helping lead the engineer to more clearly define the problem than his designs in their own right. It is this sensible, sensible approach that in fact defines the engineer's disposition toward the problem. As each problem is shaped by objective parameters, so then are these parameters shaped by a particular point of view. And it is just these points of view that the engineer considers and reconsiders in shaping each proposed solution until finally the right problem emerges. Invoking the title of Rice's book, we could say that the engineer imagines alternatives that reveal the designs that reveal what the design solution might be depending on which parameters are considered imposing the problem. Breaking with the what is in favor uh, of the what if, the engineer uses the design to think through and solve problems. Knowing which parameters, which what if to work with, and in what ways is enhanced and expanded with each new problem the engineer poses and solves, whether it results in an innovation or not. Even within the framework of a single design problem, each parametric change and subsequent um, question, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, even within the framework of, of a single design problem, each parametric change and subsequent question and solution increases the engineer's design knowledge or intelligence about a material, a structure, or a process. And this knowledge can become important in other or future problems when adjusting the parameters to those problems. The, re the rewards of innovation extend then beyond the parameters that shape those problems um, and become uh, beyond the immediate problem and at hand and become engines for creating new design intelligence or knowledge that further enhances the engineer's ability to design uh, innovative solutions. Rice ultimately leaves us to draw the surprising conclusion that design drives innovation rather than the other way around. And it is this uh, incredibly powerful insight, I think, that offers the key to developing new values for new design, especially for design education. I'm going to show you just a couple of, that's Peter Rice. Uh, sorry, I should have shown him earlier. Um, I'm going to show a uh, run through, uh, one very, very quick uh, spin through a studio that we did this last year. It's a one year uh, R&D studio. It's a research problem in the fall, and they make a design solution in the spring. But I'm going to focus, I'm just going to show this is typically what you do in a studio. Students go and visit cool places like Oslo. Uh, they wander around on famous architecture. Um, they wander through fields. They sit around tables. They design. They act foolish. They go to Brussels. This was actually interesting because our students uh, visit. The studio was taught by this uh, second term studio was taught by Julian de Schmidt. And one of the things the students really took away from the studio, uh, or, or working with Julian in, in Brussels, was this table. They started, uh, they had their tables all uh, sort of lined up individually uh, in their studio when they left to visit, when they came back. They stuck them all together like they had in Julian's office, which actually turned out to be uh, a real kind of innovation in, in, in terms of the way the studio was organized. But this is just sort of normal stuff. I, I, I want to show you all this to get to this which is, which, is, uh, which is a model, sort of the final model um, that the studio produced. And I want to focus on this just a little bit here uh, to say this, that 
um, once we finished the studio, it was put online as a feature project for Archonnect. And we had a, you know, we, 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 the, the studio sort of uh, concluded with a, um, with a final review uh, in Louisville, Kentucky at uh, 21C Hotel. We had about 300 people come and have a huge public discussion about the model and about the implications of the model and about the implications of the, of the design. What really, I, I think, I want to sort of get to very quickly here, of course, I only have four minutes left, um, is this. We, th there was a discussion on Archonnect uh, about uh, the, the project, and it devolved into this huge debate over the model itself, but not over what the model actually was doing, but in fact, uh, it, the discussion and the debate really had to do with what the model represented to people. Um, there were people who loved it because they liked uh, what it looked like uh, and they liked what they thought it represented to them and there were people who hated it because, uh, because of the exact opposite reason. There were more than 100 comments online about the model uh, but, what they, but what really, I think, didn't get discussed and what couldn't be discussed in the way that it was published online was that the model was literally an object and a tool for thinking through the larger problem of the, of the city and of presenting it publicly and having a discussion about it. So, which means that the object uh, was not so much a final object and a final design as it was a means of having a, a, a larger discussion and, and, and that's not where it ended. Um, uh, it's a, it, was a, it was a very peculiar and perverse sort of uh, online discussion at Archonnect. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, but at the end of the day, it really didn't, it didn't really solve a lot. So uh, in, in, in closing here, I'm struggling with my own phone, uh, hoping not to get another call. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just make a few concluding comments about that studio and about how we work and about what I think that meant. I just say that such limited, unheroic, and seemingly trivial actions as those that I tried to characterize in those pictures uh, th th that were undertaken this last year, I believe begin to sketch the outline for what new values of new design might look like. Cheap, fast, adaptable, so that hundreds of iterations can be designed, sorted, and discarded. Big, bold, and dumb, so that clients, stakeholders, and even other architects can, en can engage in transparent, productive discussion that might lead to better problems and better solutions. And finally, a posit, not perfect, so that if the design needs to adapt to changing conditions, it can do so with minimal effort and cost. I would just say, uh, in closing, and, 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 and that if architecture is to thrive during and after the current economic downturn, it will have to adapt to these and other values of the good enough revolution, where the quick and dirty have eclipsed the slow and polished, and the cheap and simple have eclipsed the expensive and complicated. It is no wonder that in such times, business schools, the military, and engineering schools have embraced, have embraced design thinking. The question remains whether schools of architecture will join them or will continue as they did before the downturn. What is more certain is that architecture offices and architecture schools unwilling or unable to innovate, communicate, and adapt will soon be left behind, comforted only by the memories of those expensive incomprehensible and perfectly designed objects that not too long ago fascinated all of us. Thank you.